Hey, good morning, Cock a.m. Eastern, and it's 6 a.m. California time, and I am just having my first cup of coffee. So, good morning, and I hope you can hear me. So, I want to... There you are. I can hear myself. Okay, so let me know if you can hear me. I'm Paul Moore with Wellings Capital and Bigger Pockets, and I'm so happy to be here with you this morning. It's early, and so I'm glad you're with me. So, if you're on YouTube or Facebook Live, or if you are on Bigger Pockets Live, give me a shout out. Tell me who you are, where you're from, and we're going to get started. Thank you, David Moore. Glad you can hear me. Hello there. Somebody with a Russian name that I can't read. I'm so glad you're here. Big step, uh, Tion West. This is exciting. I agree. Real estate is my passion, and I'm excited about sharing this with you. Hey, Nick Greenia, how are you? Uh, we are going to get started here in just a minute. Hey, Stephen Hodge from College Station, Texas. I almost went to college in your town. Almost got my master's degree at Texas A&M. Hey, Ashley Green in Texas. Leo, hey, Zavery, hey, plant-based nurse. Plant-based, I love it, from Ohio. I've seen you before. I Darius Osborne from Dallas, living in Houston. How are you? Hey, Nick from Austin. Okay, we're going to get started in a minute here. Today, hey, Nate Shields, my friend from Madison, Wisconsin. David Moore. Okay. Hey, Jason from New York. Hey, Deval from India. So glad you're here. All right. Hey, Mark. Hey, Perry. Hey, Kyle from Lubbock. Hey, Mark. Uh, Trevor from New York City. Okay. So glad you're here. Deerfield Beach, Florida. Luis. Okay. It's going to be a hot day out there. So it's a great place to start getting excited about investing in real estate. So what I'm going to do Hey, two, met you at DealMaker Live from St. Paul. Hey, Ron, good morning. Okay, if you can give us a share or a thumbs up or a like, it'll help Facebook and uh, YouTube know that we're doing something epic and important here. You know, the stock market took a huge drop once this week, but was any of, were any of you worried? Was I worried? I was sipping my coffee and I wasn't worried at all. So hopefully you were feeling the same way because real estate doesn't go up and down like every whim. Uh, with every whim, every bad mood on Wall Street, every rumor of war in the Middle East, real estate stays steady. Real estate is true wealth because real estate is an asset that produces income. And you know, that's what true wealth is. It's not fancy cars, it's not mansions, it's not big boats. Those are nice things to have, but true wealth is assets or an asset that produces income. And if you're here with us today, hopefully you want to be somebody who has real estate assets that uh, produce income. And today, uh, Daily Grind reminded me that I am going to not talk about how to buy real estate with zero money down. Now we're gonna we're gonna we'll try to hit that as one of the Q, as part of the Q and A later, but I'm gonna talk to you about how to get into real estate with no money and no experience. We're gonna talk about six different ways to do that. But before we do, I'm gonna tell you a few fun little one or two line stories from my podcast. Have you checked out my podcast? It's called How to Lose Money. And people say, you gotta be kidding. Why would you call your podcast How to Lose Money? It's actually a wealth building podcast. And we're trying to uh, explore the stories of wealthy, successful entrepreneurs, a lot of them real estate entrepreneurs. And we'd like to explore the stories of their failures on the way to success. Thanks, Neil. Neil. Nate. Uh, okay, so um, here's a few uh, ways that other people got started. Not in real estate, but I think you'll recognize these names. The famous painter Pablo Picasso, a poor student in elementary school, was often punished by being sent to the cell, a room where he sat on a bench, isolated from other students. Pablo Picasso used his time in solitary confinement to learn to sketch, and he became the most famous and innovative painter of the 20th century, and he developed something called Cubism. Uh, William Penn, the largest land-grant holder in world history, he owned Pennsylvania, 
was expelled from Oxford for opposing the university's rule that everyone must attend the Church of England. He skipped church, uh-oh. He was imprisoned three times for writing and preaching about the Quaker faith. And he ultimately got a land grant. They wanted to get rid of him, so they sent him to America and gave him the state of Pennsylvania. Not a small feat. The famous novelist John Grisham, his first novel was called A Time to Kill. It was rejected by 16 agents and a dozen publishing houses. Winwood Press published 5,000 copies in 1989, but sales were dismal. Grisham became the best-selling author of The Firm, The Pelican Brief, uh, and it prompted Dell to publish A Time to Kill in paperback in 1992. It was made into a motion picture in 1996. That was just his first novel. Lyndon Johnson, the president after JFK, was kicked out of Southwest Tex Texas State's Teachers College. He drove to California in a 1918 Model T with four friends without telling his parents, and he worked as an elevator operator, grape picker, dishwasher, law clerk, and auto mechanic, and he went on to become the President of the United States. Madonna. Madonna started out by working in a donut shop in Times Square, and she became one of the most highly paid entertainers in history. Speaking of entertainers, Willie Nelson sold encyclopedias, vacuum cleaners, and frustrated by his failed attempts to make it as a musician, became a pig farmer. Now, you don't go out and be mean to Willie and say you should have stayed on the farm. But seriously, um, lots of famous, great people started out small. And today we're going to start... Uh, we're going to talk about how to start out small. So I'm so glad you're here. Hey, baby Jean from the Philippines. Wow. So we're going to talk about six ways to start out small and to get wealthy in real estate. But uh, so what I'd like to do is lay down a few ground rules. Uh, I'm going to quickly, I'm going to give you my word that I'm going to quickly go through these six ways. If you jot them down and if you have one or two ways you want to explore, what I want you to do is ask me about those ask me about that one or two ways and I'll explore it in more detail after I go through all six ways, okay? So I'm going to go through six ways to get started with little or no money, little or no experience. When I'm done, you can ask me questions and we'll explore that way. And then you can ask me anything you want. You can ask me about um, uh, self-storage, multifamily, mobile home parks, single-family homes, uh, multifamily. I already said that. You can ask me about anything you want. So here we go. So number one way to get started in real estate with little or no money down and little or no experience is... Drum roll, please. I'm trying to think what it is. No, it's uh, Airbnb arbitrage. So it's either corporate rentals or Airbnb arbitrage. I've talked about this before. And if anybody wants to talk about that, we'll talk about it a little more at the end of these six ways. Number two way is a rent to own sandwich or a lease option sandwich. Now that's come up a lot before. And I actually was going to do a whole show on that today because it we always gloss over it every Saturday. But today I'm going to take some time and talk about rent to own or lease option sandwiches if you want to. Now someone's going to have to ask me about it or I'll talk about something else. Number three is to be a deal finder. There are lots of and lots of multifamily syndicators, mobile home park syndicators, self-storage syndicators, and others out there who are dying to get deals. It used to be people were eager to get capital, and that's great, but um, it's a time in history right now where people are looking for deals. So being a deal finder is the third way to uh, get started in real estate with little or no money down. And that is um, a way that you can get experience, you can make some money, you can get ownership in the deal, and you can get connected 
to a bigger company. And speaking of all that, uh, there's a fourth way, and that is to be a capital raiser. Warning, there are SEC regulations that would prohibit you from doing this in an illegal way. So you've got to make sure you're doing it legally, ethically, morally, and all that. But you can be a capital raiser. And I know a guy, I met a guy at Michael Blanc's Dealmaker Live in Texas about two weeks ago, who I had known, I had met him before. He was on my podcast actually a couple years ago. And he has raised over $20 million this year year alone for 20 million dollars and so uh someone thinks that's a trash that's a trash way of getting forward well air jordan guess what he's made a lot a lot 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 of money he's raised 20 million dollars and he was able to quit his full-time job but he started with nothing and no experience when i met him he had very little experience so the fourth way is being a capital raiser the fifth way you're really going to hate, and that is get a job. Now, did you know that a lot of the most famous people, the most successful people at the top of the real estate game started by getting a job? Nobody, um, nobody uh, here probably wants to have a W-2 income and stay working for the man for the rest of your life, but Getting a job is a way to leverage or springboard your way into um, getting a having a real estate career. And a lot of the most famous, most wealthy, mo most successful people out there started by getting a job. And that's my fifth path. And my sixth path to get started with little or no money down would be to get a mentor. Now, you may say getting a mentor, getting a paid coach costs ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and that's true. But you can also do a different path, and that would be the path of finding, of being an apprentice to a so-called master. So being an apprentice, apprenticing yourself out to a somebody who would be willing to bring you on and let you learn the business from them. And so getting a mentor is the sixth path. So I promised you I would go through that quickly. I'm pretty proud of myself. I got through it pretty quick. And so now let's do this. Let's take your questions. And so I'm gonna start over here on the Facebook side. If you've got any questions, uh, let me know. Jody says, yes, we would love more information on Airbnb and we've been wanting to get started in this. Matt says, I like sandwiches, LOL. Hey, Dan. Hey, Matt. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is talk about corporate rentals and Airbnb arbitrage. Now, what this means is that you don't have to own a house. You don't have to own an apartment building. You don't have to own anything to do this. You can actually go in and cut a deal with somebody who owns a house, who owns an apartment building. You can go find a uh, even a brand new apartment building. I saw one last night that had like 300 units and they're leasing it up incrementally. And you could go to them and say, look, I know you've got some units that probably won't be rented up for say another year. Why don't you let me do a month to month lease and I'll be introducing new people who are moving to town, maybe through a corporate rental or people who are coming into town for a while or people are just here on Airbnb. And what you do is you lease it month to month. You rent the furniture or you go to Goodwill or Salvation Army and you pull together the furniture. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Professionally photograph it. I do a great job photographing it. Do a great job writing up the ad. There's all kinds of techniques to do that. And then you put it up on Airbnb. Then you immediately, and you keep a very short time leash on when you rent it. So don't rent it out six months from now. Just rent it out a couple weeks in advance. Then you go turn around, and they're about, my friend Al has about 17 different ways to find corporate rentals. You go in and you start going to the biggest companies in your area. Start with the hospitals, then go to the universities, 
then go to the big Fortune 500, et cetera, companies, and you go try to find people who are looking for a corporate rental, people who are tired of staying at hotels when they're there on business for two or three months at a time, and you sign up these corporate rentals. It could be a visiting professor. It could be a visiting student. It could be an international student. It could be all kinds of people, and they'll pay for a sh the benefit of a short-term lease with internet, with cable, with the utilities included, with all the furnishings, they'll pay you several times, potentially, what that apartment might rent for by itself. So the math could work something like this. And of course, I don't know where you are. If you're in New York City or San Francisco, just triple this. But anyway, seriously, um, the math could work like something like you do $800 in rent, and then you've got the rental cost of the furnishings, or hopefully you can get those furnishings there. And then you, um, uh, you've got utilities, you've got internet, you've got cable, you put all that in there. And let's say your total cost is $1,200 a month. And then you lease out the apartment for, for example, $2,000 a month. And you <clears throat> put $800 in your pocket. And now here's where the Airbnb part comes in. You put a corporate lease in there, a corporate tenant. Let's say they're there for five months. At the end of five months, let's say you don't have anybody to slide into that spot. Or let's say they leave after four months and you let them out of their lease. That's where you plug in Airbnb rentals <clears throat> until you find your next corporate tenant. Okay, so it's corporate tenants and Airbnb. It's a great strategy. Someone emailed me recently and said, you talked about this on your Saturday show, me, I talked about it um, back in February or March, something like that. <clears throat> and they said they're doing it now, he and his buddy, and they've got like, they're making like, I think he either said 7,000 or 17,000 a month profit. And so I was really happy to hear that. Actually, they emailed me to thank me. And I thanked my friend Al, who taught me a lot of this. Uh, Al is a brilliant guy he's got all this laid out in a step-by-step -step process he's doing it himself that's how he makes his living so that's it so if you want to explore that more you can me uh, you can connect with me on bigger pockets and uh, let me know that you want more information about that nathan says syndication do you secure a purchase agreement first Nathan, can you tell me a little more about what you're thinking, Nathan Norway? Uh, I'm not sure. Dan says best cities to invest in. I don't know. There's so many. Uh, John, thank you for your comment. Okay, I'm going to flip over here to YouTube. Uh, does Airbnb work in India? Thanks, Deval. Um, I don't know. I mean, Airbnb is in India, right? So uh, someone says, I'd like to know more about the lease option sandwich. We'll talk about that for sure. Uh, apprenticeship. Okay, we'll talk about that. Um, what's the best country for real estate? I heard England was pretty good. I don't know. That's what someone says. Hey, Angel from Massachusetts. Good morning, James from New Jersey. Pretty specific strategy, right? Yes, Sorel, it, it is. Um, and that was the Airbnb arbitrage strategy. Okay, so... Um, Someone says, can you repeat the six real quickly? So it's Airbnb and corporate rental arbitrage, lease option sandwiches, that's number two, being a deal finder is number three, being a capital raiser is number four, go getting a job, and we can talk about that, is number five, and finding a mentor or basically being an apprentice for free is number six. Rebecca says, mobile home parks, any advice? I'm actually writing a free special report on mobile home parks right now, and I've got a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, Rebecca, would you hang around, and we'll try to get into that maybe after we get through some of these six. So someone asked, um, does your friend Al have a website that discusses corporate rentals and Airbnb arbitrage? I don't actually know what it is. I think he got in trouble for having Airbnb in the name. And so what I think he did is he's changed the name. If you reach out to me, I will dig it out and I will get you Al's information, okay? 
Um, can I get Al on the show? Man, that would be a great idea. You know, I'm going to be with Al in Philadelphia. We're both going to be speaking at the Mid-Atlantic Summit with David Green, Bigger Pockets own David Green. And so um, we'll try to get him on the show. Maybe we'll get to do that in October. That would be great. You guys would love it. Uh, Chris says maybe you can do that in London. Someone said, "Is are there cities you can't do that like D.C.? Yeah, there are cities that have banned Airbnb. I don't know where they are. Um, someone says, is there a book you recommend for someone just getting started? Yeah, there's a great book by, St I always look to my right, even though I can't see it. For some reason, I want to see the book. What's wrong with me? Steve Burgess, B-E-R-G-E-S, How to Get bu Started, wait. The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings. That's a great book. Uh, there's also some great books by Brandon Turner and others. Uh, there's a great book by my friend Matt Faircloth. Shout out to Matt uh, on uh, the um, on capital raising, raising money. There's a great book by Oren Claff on. I recommend everybody uh, read Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. Um, and uh, some guy named Paul Moore has a book out on apartment investing as well. And so, um, so if you want to talk more about the, uh, I, I think I just told you everything I could about the Airbnb corporate rental strategy. Now, if you own apartments or if you own a basement or if you own a house, you can do the same strategy with the long-term tenants, Airbnb plugged in the middle uh, you can do it uh, probably even better if you own it because you have control of it, but you don't have to own it. You can just have a friendly relationship with an apartment. And of course, you have to get permission from them in the lease to do Airbnb. Or, you know, it doesn't have to say that in the lease, but you got to make sure they're not going to ban that. He, someone also said, Hey, Sue says, can you talk about getting a job? You know, <clears throat> before I get into the rent to own sandwich, which someone asked about, I'm going to quickly um, get in. As far as getting a job some yeah you should do cleaning and you should once a month much corporate tenant same practice corporate and their profit I've seen graphs on low profit low effort you've got sitting on an Airbnb effort still want to look yeah yeah actually uh, go to your west of Philadelphia. Rias. Okay, I promised I'd get it. Types of you know, I'm really jealous of to have gotten it from Keller Williams. Got anyway, he's done pretty but you could get five one. It would be most of what I'm thinking real estate. feet wet, getting a license, getting a paycheck, state broker, to know how the game is played, get lots of real estate agent or broker, get in. Now again, I'm thinking about commercial. If you want to be a lender, to know all the people you could get 
You can get to know other people in the loan brokerage. You would get to know investors, a broker, a broker, way to get in is wrong. All right, guys. Follow. This is unintelligent. I don't know what's going on. You saying that there's a problem. So, <laughs> attention to the chat, Mike. Start this. Right now it's nine twenty and having some trouble now. And I'm gonna take a drink of coffee. I wish I could. It's Al Williamson. Yeah. Trouble. So I don't know. The way that live stream is set up. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Al Williamson. Hung Vu said, There's a venture you'd recommend for a to do it about these job in and you guys it looks I am and so I don't so um speed test.net all right let me check my speed anyway so um we talked about becoming a commercial broker real estate broker we talked about becoming a commercial lender a lender actually for uh commercial real estate by the way my speed is very very high so i it's not on my end guys and i'm sorry and I'm not blaming anybody, but for whatever reason, it is, there is a problem. Older says now it's okay. So we talked about becoming a commercial real estate broker. We talked about becoming a commercial real estate lender. Let's talk about being a financial analyst. Now a lot, good, I'm glad it's better. Uh, a lot of people who are great at uh, running a lot of people who are great at running their business don't want to do all the financial analysis, especially these syndicators who um, are spending, you know, are looking at two or three deals a day or maybe five or 10 deals a week. Um, so they don't want to run all the numbers on that. So you could actually become a financial analyst for one of them. That's a really easy entry point into a syndicator. And so that's a third job, a fourth job is to become an asset manager. Go to work on an asset management team. My friend, Andrew Pataka, uh, shout out to Andrew, actually uh, be, took a job with Sam Zell's company who had like something like 50,000 apartment units maybe. And he actually managed uh, a huge um, portion of those apartments. I mean, thousands of apartments. He was the asset manager. Then he worked, went to work at a family office and then after years of doing all that, he took a job with the company that mentored me out of Richmond, Virginia, and he actually is their asset manager. And he probably, I'm not sure, uh, gets um, 
<laughs> he probably gets an ownership stake in all the apartments he manages now. And so that's a great path, and that's being an asset manager. And another uh, job path would be to be a property manager. Now, did you know that one of the top uh, apartment managers in the U.S., property manager, is also an apartment owner named Rick Graff. Rick Graff, G-R-A-F, with Pinnacle Property Management, actually started out as a porter during college. He was a porter. He took a low-level job, and from that low-level job, he actually vaulted himself through his career path to the top of the third, I think, largest property management firm in America. So that is certainly something you might want to consider. So that is getting a job. And so Gio Sayo says it was the Russians, they're listening. The Russians are listening. Wait a minute, there's actually some Russians on here. You guys aren't causing any trouble, are you? That's not true. All right. Hey, thanks, Born. Appreciate it. That dude, it's working now. Okay, great. So someone asked me about a rent-to-own sandwich or a lease option sandwich. Y'all, my southernness is coming out. Uh, make sure you check out the steps on this because I've never talked about it in as much detail as I'm going to right now. Okay, here's how a rent-to-own works. Okay, a rent-to-own means, now we're, and then we'll get into the sandwich next. A rent to own is you own a property and you're selling it and you basically rent it to somebody and they rent it for let's say two, three, four years and then they close on it and own it, okay? And a lot of people want to do a rent to own if their credit's bad. Let's say they can't get a mortgage, they cannot get a bank loan, they can't buy the house in a normal way and so they do a rent to own and you as the owner of a property might get the benefit of getting an income stream of rental before it's sold and you set it at a future higher price you set the house let's say you're selling the house for 150,000 if it was sold today through a realtor you'd only make maybe net after paying a realtor's commission and closing costs and all that you might make like 141 instead of 150 well, with the rent to own, you can go directly to the buyer, and that means you can get the 150, usually, not always, without the real estate commission. And on top of that, you can say, well, I'm not gonna close, I'm gonna give you uh, this favorable mortgage situation, and I'll increase the price. You know, the house might be worth 165 in three years. So we're gonna tack on five thousand dollars a year to the sales price for every year until you close so if they say i think i can close in two years but it might be three you just basically set the sales price for again five thousand a year for example above the current price for every year until they close and so if they close in three years the price is 165. now what you do is you collect uh, rental payments all on the way until then. And what you do is if the normal rent on that house would be, let's say, $750, you change it to, let's say, $900 or even $1,000, and you say, okay, I'll apply that last $150 or $250 or whatever to the, pay to the uh, down payment. And so what will happen is, First of all, they'll leave you a deposit of say three, four, five thousand dollars or more up front. So that's money in your pocket. And that's non refundable, by the way, if they walk away. And then after that, this extra, let's say the last two hundred dollars on their rent payment, you say if you make every payment on time and in full, and if you keep the house maintained well, then I will apply, let's say, two hundred dollars a month toward the actual purchase of the home and so let's say in i'm just i shouldn't do this off the top of my head but in 30 months at a hundred dollars a month they've just got three thousand dollars extra applied to the purchase of the property so they buy it for 165 but really is only actually they're only having to get a loan on let's say 155 because they put down let's say an eight a seven thousand dollar down payment and they built up three thousand in that 30 months, let's say 
toward the purchase of their home. But again, you only give them that credit if they make every payment on time and in full. Now folks, what will typically happen, and I heard this almost 20 years ago and I didn't believe it, but trust me, after doing dozens and dozens of these, it's absolutely true. 70 to 80% of the people will not follow through because it's just an unfortunate truth and that is that whatever situation, whatever happened in their life to get them to a place where they didn't have good credit, where they couldn't get a loan, it's probably going to repeat itself. They either change jobs several times, they can't hold down a job, they go out and, and, and mess up their credit, and they typically end up saying, coming to you in about two and a half years and saying, uh, <clears throat> John, I, I'm sorry, I can't close on this house. I am going to need to walk away. I feel so bad. Um, will you please just let me out of my agreement? And of course, you're surprised and you, you're not really surprised. And you say, well, okay, but you know, I can't refund you the down payment. Of course you can't. And they say, okay, that's fine. And what happens is typically they stop making payments about then and they leave in let's say a month and you never hear from them again you go in clean the house maybe paint it up a little bit and then you put it back on the market through craigslist or wherever and you start your next rent to own or lease to own it's the same thing now i promise to talk about lease option sandwiches i just talked about a lease option not the sandwich what's a lease option sandwich you might ask thanks for asking a lease option sandwich is when you don't own the home in the first place. You actually rent it from somebody, go in, clean it up, paint it a little bit, maybe do nothing at all, and then you rent it to somebody else. You rent it for, let's say, just the exact level of their mortgage payment. Why would anybody do that? I'll tell you in a minute. So let's say you cover the mortgage, taxes, and insurance, and let's say that's 800 a month and then you rent it back out to the next person for, let's say, $1,200 a month. Does this look like a sandwich? It should, and you're in the middle, you're the meat, okay? So you're renting it from somebody for, say, $800 a month, you rent it to somebody else for, let's just say, $1,200 a month, hopefully more, and you pocket the $400 a month. Now, it's important to understand that you need to tell that first person that you're renting from that you can't guarantee you will continue to make payments. You can't guarantee, you, you leave an out clause in there and say, I might have to walk away from this rent. Because you know, going into 2008, there were a lot of stuff, a lot of bad stuff happened in 2008. And of course that probably won't happen again, but it could. And if it does, you don't wanna be on the hook for their, let's say $150,000 mortgage. Now, you might ask, and, and so the, the other side, the, the top side of the sandwich, when you rent it to own it to somebody else, you're basically doing the same thing I just described the last five minutes, okay? You're doing a rent to own contract. By the way, when you do a rent to own contract with somebody, you should have a separate contract for the rental and a separate contract from that to the purchase, okay? Because if you get in court with these people, if you have to evict them, you don't want the judge to be acting on both uh, on both the rent and the purchase. You want them to be acting only on the own the the rental side. You want them to evict on the rental contract. You don't want them to even act at all on the purchase side. So do a separate contract and they're joined together, but they're separate. So the judge will only be acting on the rental contract. You can think through and figure out why that might be. You don't want the judge to just willy-nilly flip through the contract and say, oh yeah, you need to give them their $5,000 deposit back. By the way, that's happened. You don't want that to happen to you. Now, how would you find a rent to own? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, doesn't mean it's easy, but you actually go through the uh, trustee sales or the auctions on the courthouse steps. And as soon as they come out, let's say, uh, Monday's newspaper, there's three or four or five new auctions in your town, you go and you find the phone number or you actually go to the door of those houses and you say, hi, 
hey, um, and you stand way back on the porch so you don't scare them. And you say, and, and if, if you've got, a, a, if you're a, a woman, take a man with you. If you're a man, maybe take a woman along with you so you don't intimidate them as much. Stand back, uh, don't dress too nice or too sloppy. And you say, hey, I saw your home that's coming up for auction uh, on the courthouse steps here in three weeks, and I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I'm actually here. I might be able to rescue home from your home from foreclosure. And then you tell them some stats. You say, did you know that it's actually easier to recover from a bankruptcy than a foreclosure? A foreclosure goes on your record, and it's going to be there on your record for a very long time. It's going to smash your credit score. I understand your credit score is already taken a hit. But we might be able to rescue it by rescuing this home. What are you planning to do? And they say, well, we're planning to move to Cincinnati or wherever uh, to move in with my kids or whatever. I don't know why I made that example up. And um, we, we can't keep this home anymore. And you say, well, uh, how far behind are you? And you develop a friendly relationship with them. Maybe go to the coffee house or, or a coffee shop or maybe go tour the house and they sit in their living room. And they say, yeah, you know, we're two, three months behind. Plus, we've got this $500 lawyer bill tacked on. Plus, we got this advertising bill for this courthouse steps auction coming up. We need to come up with $3,000 to save this. And you say, and by the way, this is exactly what we did several times with people. Uh, you say, well, um, if, I, if, you're gonna, if you're willing to go ahead and move out, clean the house. Again, I can't promise I can do this, but what I can do is I can do my very best to try to come up with that $3,000 before that three-week deadline, pay, catch up your mortgage, and then I will start pay, making your mortgage payments directly if I can find someone else to rent or buy this from me. And I am a specialist at that. That's something that I know how to do. Of course, you know, you have to do it and know how to do it before you can say you're a specialist but um, and then they move out and you go in and hopefully it's already clean they leave it nice and clean you, you tell them that's a condition you write a con conditional contract with them you start making their mortgage payments you catch the three thousand dollars up of course where are you gonna get that three thousand dollars it's from the other side of the sandwich it's from the person who's renting it from you because you're gonna immediately advertise it in Craigslist and say coming soon uh, this beautiful house to rent for, let's say, $1,200 a month. Now, you may say, how are you going to get somebody to pay $1,200 for a house that's normally $800? Well, remember, they were paying the mortgage taxes and insurance based on their purchase of the house maybe years ago, and now that house is worth more, number one. But number two, the top person in the sandwich, the person you're renting to, is willing to pay a premium to get the rent to own because they can't get a mortgage and they want to live in a house, not an apartment. And number two, they're willing to pay a premium because part of that money, let's say one, two, three hundred dollars, is going toward their purchase. So they come up and they pay you, let's say, a four thousand dollar deposit to move in. You've got your three thousand to pay off the old, uh, the the people moving out, the bottom part of the sandwich and you put $1,000 in your pocket. And then you put, in my example, $400 a month in your pocket along the way, and you are off to the races. And now, when that 70 to 80% chance of the, t the second person in your sandwich moves out, no worries. You just go put it on Craigslist again, and or tr you know Truly or Zillow as a rent to own or whatever, and you advertise it and do it again, and then you do it again, and you'll probably do it an average of four or five times before selling it. Guess what's happening? While you sleep, that mortgage is being paid down little by little. And if there's like 17 years left on a 30-year mortgage, and you do this, say, four times, and it takes two to three years each, you might, like my friend in Roanoke, Virginia, have that mortgage paid off. And then you own it free and clear, and now the $1,200 a month you're charging goes straight in your pocket, except for taxes and insurance, of course. Great deal. And you may just decide to keep that house and do Airbnb, corporate rentals, furnished rentals. You might decide to just uh, sell it outright. You may decide to move into it. You've got an asset that creates income. And as we said at the top of the hour, true wealth is assets 
that produce income. Okay, that was the most thorough explanation I've ever given of rent to own sandwiches. And thank you for listening. So um, Rosa says, how can you find how much the property value increase in the trough years in uh, through the years? Um, sorry. Um, well, you can just check. There are some statistics you can get out there, but you can just assume uh, and assuming is a bad thing, I know. Two or three or four percent a year, but you can tack on a little bit in the rent tone sandwich because remember, you own the cards, you have the cards, you're in control. You actually have power over both the person moving out and the person moving in. You've got the cards, my friends. Do you recommend a local mentor or doing it yourself? Um, Kua, uh, I recommend. Kua Zhang. Um, yeah, you, you can find mentors. I don't think you need a local mentor. You can find um, <clears throat> you can my, you can find a mentor uh, online. You can find a local one possibly uh, to mentor you, but it's also possible that you can find uh, one online, and that's how I did mine. Even though mine was in the same state as me, I still did most of my mentoring online. And so in rent to own, where does the pre-existing equity go? Oh, <laughs> Sarel, it goes to you. Because, okay, so I, I'm gonna, I don't wanna spend a whole lot more time on this, but one time in Vinton, Virginia, which is near Roanoke, we bought a house. Um, we, we got in, we didn't buy it. I mean, we got in this sandwich thing. It was worth like 170 when we got it, okay? The guy moving out, just he had to walk away with just nothing, okay? So he got no cash. You could choose to give him money or you could choose to say to them, hey, when this closes someday, I'll send you a check for 5,000 or something to give them some of their equity. But typically, no, that all that equity goes to you because you're taking over the mortgage. By the way, there's some more nuances in there that I didn't explain. One is using a land contract and I don't have time and I'm not a lawyer, but you, not a land contract, I'm sorry. A land trust. A land trust is it will help you make sure you don't trigger the due on sale clause. And that's more technical than I want to get into right now. Justin Warren says, question advice. I'm just starting my journey in real estate. I have an opportunity to buy two quads. Wow, six of that eight are rented. Am I biting off more than I should as a first time investment? Justin, make absolutely sure that you know the numbers. Make sure that you know that the numbers are solid, that you've got somebody looking over your shoulder. Make absolutely sure that you are, you know, you're doing the right thing. But if you've got a chance to get a really good deal on eight units, that's that could be great. I think that could be a great place to start. Sigma says they're in Cape Cod. What do you do if it's expensive in your area? Yeah. You, um, you can, you should try to consider doing it somewhere else. Uh, and you can, there's all kinds of ways online to do it. That you can do it through syndicators. You can invest with somebody. There's all kinds of things you could do. Joe Pratt says, if we ask you enough times, would you be willing to talk about a land trust? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I meant a, yeah, a land trust is basically where you put the property, you take it out of the name of the seller. Okay, remember the seller in the lease option sandwich. You put it in, let's say, um, you take it out of John Smith's name and you, you have him transfer it to a land trust. And let's say that land trust is 123 Main Street uh, Land Trust. You know, okay. But here's the thing, you control the land trust. Okay, so now it's like 95, maybe 99% owned by you, 1% by the seller, but you have the document drawn up. It's a short document that you have 100% control and over that. And the mortgage company doesn't see that there's a new owner on it, okay? And they don't care, by the way. We have, I've, I've surveyed a bunch of people to ask them about this, Joe, and nobody has ever heard of a due on sale clause being triggered in a mortgage. In other words, no one's ever heard of a mortgage company saying, wait a minute, John Smith's not paying this mortgage anymore. We're calling the mortgage in, okay? But just to be safe, from what I understand, you should put it in a land trust. 
Okay, guys, we're coming down to the last 11 minutes of the show. It's 9.49 Eastern, and so I'm going to go on rapid fire here and try to answer everything I can. So if you haven't got your questions answered, you can know for sure that I have not seen your question, and therefore you should probably copy and paste it back in, um, and uh, I will try to answer. Ron says, yes, Ron, this will be saved and published today. Desi B, I'm starting to save money to buy my first property. What's the ideal amount I should save? Probably 25 to 35% down. So if it's 100,000, you should try to save 25 to 35 or have access to it. Realtor won't show a listing for two weeks. It may be a hoarder house situation. What damage should I look for at showing? Uh, man, that's crazy, Lars. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I, uh, I think you should just ask the realtor and actually, you know, maybe even call your local real estate board and say, Hey, I want to know, call the broker above that realtor and say, I want to know what's going on here. I'm really interested in this house. I can't get them to show it. So call the broker. And if the broker won't answer, call the local real estate board. You won't really have any leverage, but if they call the realtor or the broker, at least you'll get something going. Paul O'Connor says, what are the numbers you should know? Net operating income, ROI, ARV, cash on cash, to invest in form. What numbers matter most? Paul, um, great questions. Y'all, I'm, I did it again. I'm actually doing a free mentoring call this Wednesday uh, where people can just call into a conference line I don't have the number handy here, and I, I don't want to even put it out here. But if you want to reach out to me on Bigger Pockets, connect with me. I do a call where I spend 45 minutes just answering additional questions and going a little deeper. deeper. Um, Paul, I don't. Yes, you need to know all those for sure, and and more. And so I don't really know what else to tell you about that. Tu Fang, hey Tu Fang. If you need help, I've done lease options before. I actually do BRRR with lease options. Hey, there you go, folks. So that's T-O-U-F-A-N-G, Tu Fang. And Tu Fang, where are you from? Are you from Minneapolis area, Detroit? Um, anyway, best way to navigate borrowing money from a family member for a real estate deal. Nancy, get it all in writing. Treat it all just like you would anybody else. And... Um, be very careful. Be very, very careful with that relationship. I'm not against doing that at all. Uh, I've borrowed money. I borrow money sometimes from close friends or family members, and I pay them a nice interest rate just like I would anybody else. Jonathan says, is it possible to own a small number of doors in an apartment complex? That's called a fractured condo sometimes. And Jonathan, it's, <clears throat> it's really probably not the best situation but if you want to talk more about that we could if you want to jump on my wednesday call naveen says with the market at its peak is it still a good time for a first time investor in real estate naveen this is why i'm actually doing a special report now on mobile home parks and self-storage because there are still opportunities it's when there's fractured ownership and this is when there's really not um, uh, to Fang, I thought that was you from St. Paul, Minnesota. When there's fractured ownership, um, that means that there are um, the owners are not professional operators. Like 90% of mobile home parks or 50 to 60% of self storage are not professional owners. That's when you can actually go in and still find a deal, even at this late time in the cycle. I don't know that the market's absolutely at its peak but I think it's got to be close. And so um, anyway, um, so uh, I am going to take a few more questions. I'm not going to be able to look back through all of the questions. So if you have a question, please ask it now. Carl says, I have started getting properties here in my country, 20% below market value, but I'm having a hard time searching for partners or ventures to finance. Uh, Carl, what, what country are you in? Maybe somebody else from your country will show up on here and want to work with you. Um, but Bigger Pockets would be a great place to connect with people from your country. You know, we have a million and a half people, according to my friend Matt Faircloth now, a million and a half people, wow, on Bigger Pockets. Harold Watkins says, what does everybody do for property insurance if you paid cash for a property and plan on fixing it up before a cash out refinance? 
Um, I I like I don't like going to the huge companies, the national companies anymore. I like to go to a local broker and get my property insurance that way. And so um, you might want to find a local, like in Virginia, I love using Rockingham Insurance, and they don't pay me to say that. Um, Pretty Lou 2010 says, I'm trying to get an FHA 203k loan, but I don't have enough money for the down payment. What would be a good idea to get the money? Family and friends don't have it. Um, you know, if you could do that on a really short term basis, you might be able to go to a hard money lender to get that or somebody else to do what's called a private money loan. You could actually make an advertisement on bigger pockets and try to find somebody to partner with you. Um, I hope that helps a little. Um, if it's really short term and you know, if, if you had a really good way to pay it off quickly, you might be able to put it on a credit card. Oh man, Dave Ramsey, don't shoot me. Don't shout me down. Lewis Collins says, what's the best way to skip trace a property owner? There are skip tracing services. I don't know what they are, but you can Google that. You found the name from a county tax assessor. Yeah. Um, hey, Nate Shields, can you answer the question about how to get the private money for the 203k loan if you're still on here? Thanks. Uh, Nate knows a lot of stuff that I don't know. Debt Dude 392 says, let's say we have $50,000 saved, good credit, own my house with $80,000 in equity. Where would you start in real estate investing? Great. Well, you might be able to loan money to the other guy who wants some money. But seriously, um, if you have that much, if you're a non-accredited investor, you may want to dip your toe, or accredited or non-accredited, I should say, you might want to dip your toe into the crowdfunding sites and try to find somebody good to, um, um, to uh, invest with, you know, like a syndicator. Now, be really, really careful. Some of the syndicators online you know, they don't always have the best deals. Joe says, what was your first deal? Uh, I had some bad deals I don't want to talk about before I actually was a real estate investor. Um, don't try this at home. But uh, we actually bought a house for $34,000 on an icy, snowy day in December on the courthouse steps in Virginia and just spent $3,000 fixing it, cleaning it, and sold it for $65,000. And that was a great way to get started in the year 2000 in real estate uh, investing. Can you sell a house but keep the lot to lease back to the new owner? <laughs> Does it have a separate lot, M M1P1 or M1P 1954? Does it have a separate lot? Because if it has a separate lot, you might want to cut the lot off that's what i did actually that's exactly what i did once i cut a lot off i sold the house and a, a small lot took this other lot and sold it for twenty five thousand dollars and that was also before i was a real estate investor i forgot about that deal so i actually did something right uh that dude says oh yeah you already answered that dad dude you're in a really good position don't put all that money in one place um find maybe spread that you know maybe take 40 or 50,000 of the equity, get an equity line of credit, and then leave it paid down. I mean, don't, don't pull the cash out until you find a good deal. Um, Slayers, oh, oh, so Carl's in the Philippines. Anybody in the Philippines? Uh, Carl needs some money to help. Um, Rebecca wants to talk about mobile home parks, and I'm almost out of time. Rebecca, if you would connect with me on Bigger Pockets, I just did a 35 minute presentation talking about everything I know on mobile home parks. So Rebecca, uh, since we're almost out of time, I will tell you it's a great, great place to invest. Folks, mobile home parks are the only place I know where there's a shrinking supply and an increasing demand every year. And so I highly recommend you get into mobile home parks. Rebecca, if you'll connect with me on Bigger Pockets, ask for the webinar that I did in June of 2019, that was about a month and a half ago, uh, on mobile home park investing. And honestly, everything I know about it is on there. And it's much better than me trying to give you a 30 second answer here. Biling trailer homes is a good investment. Jorge, I think it's a horrible investment. I like buying mobile home parks, buying the dirt. And by the way, two weeks ago, Frank Rolf was the guest on the Bigger Pockets podcast, and he talked about buying mobile home parks. He's done very well in that. You're welcome, Rebecca. Hey, Rose. Um, 
Best way to connect with contractors, get some rehab skills for free. It's hard to work around my schedule. Um, Paul, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, just go out and basically try to find, go to a local real estate as, uh, investor association, R-E-I-A, RIA. And uh, that is what you should do. Hey, folks, did you realize that Bigger Pockets is having their first national conference? It's in Nashville, Tennessee at Grand Old Opry or something, uh, October 6th through 8th. I'm going. I'm going to be speaking there. Brandon Turner will be speaking. David Green will be speaking. Matt Faircloth, uh, Mindy Jensen. There's going to be a lot of great speakers at the Bigger Pockets First National Conference. If you haven't signed up, it's not cheap, but you're going to get the experience of a lifetime connecting with other folks on Bigger Pockets. If you're not going to the conference, or even if you are, I still highly recommend that you sign up for Bigger Pockets Pro. Get a pro membership. It's the best thing I've done in my 27 uh, or so year entrepreneurial career. Uh, I've enjoyed having a Bigger Pockets Pro membership, and it doesn't cost that much for what you get, and you get all kinds of discounts on all kinds of things. So, Happy Saturday. Happy weekend. Thank you for spending some time with me early on Saturday morning. And I really do appreciate all of you. If you want to join my mentoring call this Wednesday, I'm doing a 45-minute call. We had three people last week. Thanks for coming out. You can ask some more in-depth questions, and I can chat with you back and forth verbally on a conference line. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great Saturday. Have a great weekend. Go out and enjoy the sunshine, and we'll talk next time on Bigger Pockets Live.